are we live? Is it 2 p.m. on a ROM Toronto Instagram account? Nice to see you all from our house to yours. It's the ROM Kids Show. Uh, my name's Kieran. Uh, I run the camps here at the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, and over the next 30 minutes, we're going to chat with you with our special guest, uh, paleontologist Ashley Reynolds, about saber cats. So if you are interested in paleontology, saber cats, and maybe doing some art on some saber cats, Hang out with us for the next 30 minutes. We are very, very excited. Uh, last week on the Rom Kids show, we had Justin Cuicato on to talk about water equity uh, and the importance of having uh, access to water all over the world, especially here uh, in Canada. That was a lot of fun doing that. We did some experiments with that too. Next week, Mark Peck is on the show, an ornithologist here at the museum. And we're gonna talk about winter birds, but again today, Paleontologist Ashley Reynolds is on to talk all about saber cats and her latest study on some saber, I'm gonna call them toddlers, uh, maybe kittens is like too small a word, but some saber toddlers. Uh, so we're very excited to do that. That's nice to hear, oh hey Vip, what's going on? Nice to see you for a second right there. Uh, love to all your family, good to see you all. Um, with that, I think I'm ready to give it a go. Theme song portion ah, of the event. Welcome to the Rom Kids Show with me. We'll do some crafts and tell some stories. Let's talk about science, art, and history. Welcome to the Rom Kids Show, starring you and me. There you go. That's the theme song portion of the event. It's time to put that down and move over to the art table. Hello, hello, hello to everyone in their uh, kitchens or um, at their art tables in their own house. Nice to see you. Uh, to all the classrooms out there, hello, hello, hello. I guess you're all virtual too. Nice to see you. Uh, today, it's about paleontology. It's about science. It's about cats. It's about saber cats. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to do this episode because I don't know a lot about the Ice Age, and I don't know a lot about saber cats, but they're kind of super awesome. So I'm excited to learn today. So, um, hello, uh, nice to see everyone here. Kelly Holloway, how's it going? All right, so with that, let's get ready for the art project. Today we are making these chomping saber tooth cats. I absolutely love this project. My cat is super cute. Uh, look, look at that little hair because when like you're a little toddler cat you got like your little hair going everywhere um, So I like that and it does that chomping action So we're gonna be making these today while we have our conversation with pa paleontologist Ashley Reynolds. What do you need? You need some paper, okay? A cardstock works best because it's a little bit thicker uh, Which means uh, that it's gonna stay up a little bit better um, You need a pencil to do your drawing with you need coloring materials. I will be using Sharpies because they stand out a little bit better on camera, but you can use crayons, you can use markers, you can use all of those things. Um, you're gonna need a clothes pin as well, uh, preferably one that does this little chomp action, all right? So it has to do that. Um, then you're gonna need some scissors to be able to cut your chomping saber cat out with, and glue stick or tape. I've used tape in the past, but I find it just falls off and I just don't think that's useful when you want it to work. Um, so the advice from our household to yours is if you have like a glue stick, use that glue stick. While you're gathering all your materials, um, very excited to do this, let's introduce our special guest, paleontologist, woo, Ashley Reynolds, hello. Hi, how are you? How's it going? Oh, so excited to have you on the show today. Um, we obviously love paleontology on this show from the many episodes we've done on it, but we've never talked about the Ice Age. We've never talked about some of those cool mammals that came along after the dinosaurs. And we get to do that today um, with Ashley Reynolds here, a paleontologist um, at the Royal Ontario Museum. This is so cool. The first steps I want to do for everyone at home before we get to our conversation is I want you to draw on your paper, preferably cardstock, um, your creature, okay? So I did a saber cat. 
you can do whatever you want. You can get, uh, imagine if it's art, so art belongs to you and however you want to do it, okay? So that's my saber cap there. I already drew it so that I can do coloring on the show. Um, my big pro tips is just make sure that the head is roughly the same size as the front, okay? The front of your clothespin, all right? And that'll sort of help make the chomping action work the best that it can. Once you've finished drawing your, your, your animal, then color it in, okay? That's what I'm gonna do with you. And then later on, I'll tell you how to do the chomping part. Um, but let's start off with our conversation with Ashley. Thank you again for being here. You are a paleontologist, and I think when we think of the word paleontology, we think of it as only meaning dinosaurs. But that's not what you study. What part of paleontology do you study? So what I do is I study fossil mammals, which means instead of studying fossil dinosaurs, I study things that are actually more closely related to you and me. Um, for me, the things I really like are fossil cats. So I specialize in studying saber-toothed cats. Huh. Okay, so when because we're talking about saber-toothed cats today. Like, look at that, chompo, chompo, chompo. Um, when did saber cats live? They lived a, a long time ago. So the first saber-toothed cats showed up hmm, probably about 25 million years ago. And they lived up until the end of the Ice Age, the end of the Pleistocene, which was about 11,000 years ago. Whoa, Pleistocene. And what is it again that like, what, what draws you to this type of, you know, the geologic time scale? Well, I think the Pleistocene or the Ice Age, as most people will know it as, is one of the most interesting time periods for a number of different reasons. One, it was a time period when all across North America and South America, there were a whole bunch of giant animals. So if you walked around the plains of North America, it was more similar to the African savanna than it was to what we have today. So you would see big elephants like mammoths, you would see all of these big meat-eating animals. It's super cool. The other thing that's really interesting is about the Pleistocene is that it was a time when the climate was changing and the climate is changing today. So if we look at how things changed during the Pleistocene and how all these animals interacted when humans started to interact with them, we can, learn more about what's happening to all of the species on earth today that's really cool mammoths so big elephants elephant relatives lived in i guess canada in north america that's so cool and we can think like i guess i'm thinking about big cats today i think about big cats in like africa where we have lions where we have what leopards cheetahs um, and then I think about big cats in India with tigers. Um, but there are big cats today still in Canada. We have the puma, we have the cougar, um, which is a really cool animal. But to think we had these big, giant saber cats here as well, it just, it really blows my mind. I have a question because we have cats today. Some of us have cats in our home as well. Um, and we can see cats in different parts of the world. How are saber cats? that lived tens of thousands of years ago, how are they similar or how are they different? I guess, how are they different than the cats that live today? Well, I guess to start with, they are pretty similar to cats. So, you know, we can tell that they're cats because they have things like retractable claws, like living cats have today. They have um, the same sort of um, biting material for the most part, they have these big teeth that are used for eating meat. So that's one thing that's common to cats. But where they start to get different is that these saber-toothed cats, they have these big, big, big teeth that are shaped differently from the big teeth in living cats. So a saber-toothed cat has uh, what's called a saber. So it's this long tooth that instead of being shaped like an ice cream cone, which is how lion and tiger teeth are shaped, it's shaped like this big flat sort of cone. So I've got a cast of a saber-toothed cat canine here, and you can see it's big, it's pointy, but if I kind of flip it this way, it's really thin. So it's squished flat from side.
side to side. And you guys can't feel this, but if I run my finger along the edges, it has serrations on it. And those serrations are just like if you ever have a knife in your house, like a butter knife or a steak knife, there are these little tiny ridges on it that help it cut into things. These saber tooth were doing the same sort of thing. We learned on a previous episode with David Evans when we were talking about dinosaurs that some dinosaur teeth have serrations on it too. So what yeah, what would like how does a how does a saber cat use their tooth? It's so big, like I can see it all the time. It's just always hanging out there. Like, how do they use it? Well, they use it to eat meat. So if you think of what you use, like a steak knife for, you use it to cut steak. So those serrations are really good for cutting into flesh and meat. What's kind of interesting here is that they weren't using it for the eating process. Like when we use a steak knife, we use it to cut out the meat and then we put it in our mouth. They're actually using it to kill their prey. So if you watch a video of a lion hunting in the savannah today, you'll see that they'll chase down their prey, they'll all jump on them, and they'll start to bite them around the neck and the face. Saber-toothed cats would probably have done something similar and that they would have jumped on their prey, but instead of kind of just trying to slowly pull them down, they would pull them down with these really big, strong forearms, and then they would bite them in the throat. And Whereas a living lion bites it and kind of holds it until the animal suffocates, so it stops being able to breathe, the saber teeth would actually cause a lot of bleeding. So the animal would die pretty quickly because it was losing oxygen because no oxygen was carrying it across the body through the bloodstream. Huh. Okay, so different ways. So we're hunting in different ways. Hunting with these big cats yep. this sort of change. I guess, sorry, this is sort of a follow-up question on the saber teeth because I have an expert here, so I can just ask these questions. And if you have questions at home uh, or in your classroom, drop them in the group chat and we can pick them up with Ashley Reynolds, paleontologist. Um, what would happen if, like, I broke my tooth? Like, did that happen? It did happen sometimes. So we do have some animals that have broken canine teeth that look like they probably healed. So it looks like the animal lived after. And this is really interesting because if you break these teeth that are so vital for you eating, you know, you would think that you would find it hard to live. But it's possible, we don't know for sure yet, but it's possible that they lived in social groups and if an animal broke its tooth, it, they might have been taken care of by their group members or pride members. That is awesome. Pride members, family members, just in the same way that like many of us have like social groups that we live in and take care of each other. Um, maybe saber cats did. We're going to talk about saber cat families in a little bit. So we're going to pick back up on that. But I have a few more questions just about like the who, what, where, why, when of saber cats. So when I was growing up, saber cats were known as saber tooth tigers. Are they tigers? What's the deal? So saber-toothed cats are members of the cat family, which means that they're closely related to a tiger. But the reason why I don't call them a tiger is because they're actually equally related to a tiger and a house cat. So you would think if you called it a saber-toothed tiger, they'd be really closely related to a living tiger. But they're not that closely related to them. They're closely related to them. All living things are related in some way, but they're not as closely related as calling it a tiger makes it sound like. Okay, so what my big takeaway there is you can call it, if you're gonna call it a saber toothed tiger, you could easily call it like a saber toothed tabby or like saber toothed house yeah. cat. That's fascinating. Okay, we have one question from our friends at home about saber cat teeth. And their question is like, how many teeth did they have? And I have this picture from your study that I'm gonna hold up. So how many yeah. teeth did saber, uh, saber cats have? So they had not that many teeth. Um, I actually have to count them. So on the front of like our jaws, we have two of what we call incisors in each kind of quarter of our jaw. Um, and we have one canine, we have two premolars, and we have two or three molars, depending on if you have your wisdom teeth or not. Mm. Cats, instead, they have three of these front teeth, so they have three incisors, 
have one canine. And then how many premolars they have depends on the type of cat. So saber-toothed cat has fewer than living cats. So I actually only have two. And then they had on the top jaw, molar, top jaw, another molar, which is really big. Huh, okay, so it's interesting that these big uh, animals that are known as being like really big hunters and like effective hunters, we they don't have that many teeth overall. That's really sort of curious. They don't have that many teeth. Okay, so- Yeah, so you actually see that a lot. Sorry, No, go, go ahead, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, uh, you see that a lot in animals that eat a lot of meat. If you make your mouth shorter, your bite is stronger. So if your bite's stronger, then you're better able to eat things like me. That's that's awesome. Like I've never heard that ever before. That's so cool. Um, I hope your drawing's going really well at home. I sort of took mine the tiger route because uh, I'm going orange here. So I'll make sure I correct that as I keep going. Miss uh, Rose's class, her grade threes, want to know, uh, we don't have saber cats today, so why did they go extinct? Mm, this is a really, really, really good question. And the answer is we're not totally sure. There's a couple of different ideas. So it was pretty much everything that went extinct at the end of the ice age. We think that they either went extinct because of climate change, or they went extinct because humans were interacting with them and killing them off. Or it's possible that both of those are happening at the same time. So what it seems like is it is it seems like for different species, there are different causes. But because all of the species live in an ecosystem and they're related to each other, they eat each other, if something happens to one species, it kind of starts happening to all of the other species as well. That's really interesting. Um, I want to ask you one more question about that, and then I got a teeth question, and then we're going to talk about your study. Um, for for going, so you mentioned that they, that maybe humans, so ain't so ancient humans are like not quite like us or like us, just earlier versions of us, were interacting with these giant mammals like saber cats. That's so yeah, cool. they were. Um... Yeah, so um, where humans evolved in Africa, there were saber-toothed cats earlier than there were in North America. So our earliest ancestors grew up and started evolving with uh, saber-toothed cats. And then saber-toothed cats beat us to North America, but we probably interacted with some of the last of the saber-toothed cats in North America. Hmm. Okay, quick follow-up from our, our group chat as well is we want to know how many saber cats were in like Canada. Do we know that or like how many different types there were? Uh, in Canada, at least at the end of the ice age, there were at least two different types of saber tooth cats. There's one called Smilodon fatalis and its name means fatal knife tooth. So that's named after those big, big teeth. And the other one is called Homotherium serum. So those are the two. They've both been found in the province of Alberta. Okay, I think it's really funny that a saber cat that has like giant teeth is called Smilodon. I think that's hilarious. Which brings me back to my other question is we wanted to know um, if you could show your saber tooth again, just how big it is. Maybe like compared to like your face or something like that. Yeah, it's really big. So if I hold it up to my face, I have a pretty small head, but it's, it's bigger than my head or longer than my head is. If you have a banana at home, the banana is probably a similar length as this is. That's awesome. Okay, relating it to fruit is something we love to do on this show. Um, okay, so you're a paleontologist. You do a lot of science. You just released a really cool study about saber cats um, that also came with this beautiful photo. Sorry, illustration done by, I think, one of our favorites, paleo artists, Danielle Dufault. Um, look at that, it's just a, two saber cats right there. It's such a gorgeous illustration, and it really shows the importance of, um, of, of paleo art and things like that to describing like the work that you do. So can you tell us a little bit about your study? Because it talks about two saber cat siblings, and that's really interesting. It is. So 
what we found is we found two saber cat siblings and you can see them on the illustration that Danielle Kifo drew and as my zoom background here we've got two sort of young saber tooth cats playing with each other um, and the reason why we have these two young saber tooth cats playing with each other is because these two cats that we found we had their lower jaw so the sort of bottom jaw and we found that they had this one type of tooth that's really, really, really rare. It's found in some saber tooth cats with some smiling on, but not a lot of them. So this meant that it was probably really unlikely that they were there together just randomly. There had to be some reason why we had these two together. And when we looked into it further, they were about the same size. They looked like they were about the same age. And that meant that they were probably closely related. If they're about the same age, they're probably siblings. They probably were born together and were growing up together. Um, so I, I wanna go back to one of the things that we were talking about earlier with social circles and families. And we know with like big cats today, some of them are solitary, but we can look at lions that live in prides. So. I think it's really interesting because your study talks about how um, these two siblings, they got to grow up together. They grew up really big and maybe they were still <laughs> living with their mom. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we found one fossil that suggested that these two, I guess, saber tooth teenagers were probably still with their mom. And most animals, they leave home when they're probably the equivalent of like an early teenager, maybe a preteen. So if you think about it in human terms, most animals are probably leaving their mother when they're maybe like 10 to 12 years old. These ones were much older. So they were almost fully grown. And when you think about that, like humans, we're usually almost fully grown when we're about 17 or 18. And we still stay with our parents. So even if we move away, we still rely on our parents. It looks like these cats are kind of doing the same thing. They were 17, 18, but still at home. That's really interesting. So I, I stayed at my home uh, until I was like 20 years old. Uh, and so uh, that's interesting that these cats are also staying with their, with like their mom for a long time. Keeping with that, what is the importance? So if I'm already a really big cat and I already have like my teeth and things like that, I guess, am I still st living with my mom so that I can like still learn and have safety and like help getting food and things like that? Yeah, it's, it's probably what was happening. Um, generally, if you look at like a living cat today, they'll stay with their mom until they're able to hunt efficiently. So they're able to go out, they're able to catch their own prey and all of that good stuff. So it's pretty safe to assume that saber tooth cats were probably doing the same thing. What this is telling us is that it's possible that they were staying with their parents even longer. So even after their teeth were fully grown in and they were starting to learn how to hunt. And if that was the case, then maybe they lived in these social groups like lions. So our study didn't really tell us enough to say that for sure, mm -hmm. but it gives us this really interesting piece of evidence. Uh, Miss White's class wants to know, we were talking about prey, what did saber cats eat? Mm, very good question. Um, they would have eaten a lot of the bigger animals that were living in the same places. Most cat species, they'll eat a lot of different things will basically eat anything that's not too big and not too small. Um, for saber tooth cats, this could mean things like horses. There used to be wild horses found in North America. Could mean camels. And it could mean some of those giant ground sloths I was talking about earlier. And maybe even young mammoths and mastodon. Whoa, okay. I heard something really interesting there. Camels uh, in Canada that is really cool the diversity of animals is like so cool today but thinking about these animals that live far away from us because this show is like filmed in toronto imagining that those animals were also in canada you know tens of thousand years ago is really interesting we have another question um from our friends it did anything hunt saber-toothed cats or were they like the top predator 
Mm, it's a good question. They were probably top predators. Um, an interesting thing to think about is whether humans may have hunted them. Uh, we don't have any evidence to say that they did. We don't have any bones that have cut marks from humans. But you will eating things like their livestock or if they're coming into their village too frequently. So it's possible that humans may have hunted them. But in general, saber-toothed cats and the other cats around would have been the top predators. Um, we have another question from our friends in Miss Rose's class. Where did the last, or when and where did the last saber-toothed cat live? Hmm. The last saber-toothed cats lived about 11,000 years ago, and those would have been the ones in North America. So Smilodon fatalis is one of the last living saber-toothed cats, as well as Homo serum. Uh, I think, I don't know all of the dates off by heart, because mm -hmm. a lot of numbers to remember, but I think some of the youngest fossils that we've radiocarbon dated are from the Yukon, the Yukon Territory, um, and those are at the end of the Pleistocene, so about 12,000, 11,000 years ago. Okay, we have a couple more questions from the, from the chat. Thank you so much, very engaging. I'm not even getting through all of mine. So we're gonna do these and then we're gonna, then it's time to wrap up, okay? If I'm a saber-toothed cat and I'm living at home until I'm two years old, maybe even longer, how old would I live overall? Hmm, it's a very good question. It's a really hard question to answer when you're looking at the fossil record. We can tell how old individual fossil or the, the animals that made these individual fossils were when they died, but that doesn't mean that they died of old age. So we can kind of guess what the minimum oldest age is, <laughs> but it's hard to say what the maximum is. That's interesting. Some of the ones that I've looked at for my studies are probably about 10 to 13 years old and living cats can live up to 20 to 30 years old. Yeah, and as we learned earlier in the show, saber, uh, saber cats are as related to tigers as they are to house cats, which is like one of, one of the coolest things I've learned. One of the final steps to your project, and then we're gonna take one more question and then get ready to wrap up, is when you're ready, you're going to sort of chop off the part, in this case, it's the head of our saber cat, so that you can make your chomping action, okay? And so you just cut right along a line where it makes sense, and then you tape or glue or adhere that to the top of your clothespin, and then the rest of your body goes along the bottom, okay? And so for mine, what I would do is I'm gonna cut right along that line there, and then I would attach that to this, and the bottom to the bottom, okay? So that's how that all sort of connects together, and I'm gonna cut it live so I can show you. Um, we have a question because we're talking about social groups and families. We know that like wolves hunt in packs. Would saber-toothed cats have hunted in packs? We don't know yet. Um, some scientists think they could have. Some scientists don't think they could have. Um, so that's some of the research that I'm trying to do in the next couple years is trying to get more evidence to try to answer that question. Um, but it's still an open question. And, you, and so sort of looking at what we were talking is we had a family here where the mom would have to do most of the hunting. Then it would train her kids on how to do that. And then they would go off maybe to have their own little families. Okay, um, we are sort of getting really close to the end, but I wanted to highlight on something that's really important to me when we were talking about cats today. So many homes where you are right now, there might be a pet cat there, okay? Maybe a little friend named Bingo or Spot or something like that. So I guess I would want to know if some saber cats would do things that maybe our cats would do today. Such as, would they love to sit in a box? Okay. Would they play with string? Would that be something that they were interested in? Um, could you pet like a saber cat only in one spot and then after that they would get really <laughs> upset with you? How do you think saber cats would be compared to like the cats that are living in our homes today? I think it would be pretty similar, pretty much like all big cats. So you can see these really fun videos from zoos where they'll get 
big boxes. They're lions, and the lions will fit in the boxes. So that kind of suggests to me that saber cats might have liked sitting in boxes too. Uh, close relatives to cats, like hyenas, do like to do fun things like sitting in boxes. So it seems to be a cat and cat relative specialty. Um, I don't know if they'd play with string. String might be a little bit too small, but they'd probably play with the balls. Oh. Cats love balls of string, right? As for where you could pet a, a saber-toothed cat, I am not sure. I don't know if I'd want to risk it, though. I don't know if I want to be the person who tests out where you could touch the saber-toothed cat. Okay, another question we have is, uh, often many of our cats at home, you know, when they get nice and snuggly, they all purr and things like that. What is saber cat have purred? Ooh, it's a good question. They might not have purred, but they probably would have made other kind of cat-like sounds, like little mews and things like that. Purring is, is interesting. So the really big cats today don't purr, but they do roar. And we don't know if saber-toothed cats could roar. They have um, the structure of a bone that's in their throat that is not quite like non-roaring cats but not quite like roaring cats either so it's hard to say they probably made some cool sounds and probably some cat-like sounds but maybe not a purr and maybe not quite a roar either that's interesting okay my final question my final 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 question and this is just going back to climate change and how you know these animals were during a period of climate change especially as like humans were coming along what is something that you've learned from studying the Ice Age and the Pleistocene uh, and climate change that was happening then that informs our understanding of climate change today? Mm. So I think, well, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to say something that I'm in the process of learning because I think this is the really interesting thing. Um, one thing I'm learning about is um, some of the things that may have made saber-toothed cats vulnerable to extinction. And what we know about animals today is the ones that take a really long time to grow up, like these saber-toothed cats may have, are more things that takes them longer to replenish their population if some of the animals die. So it looks like that may be a reason. Huh. That's fascinating. So it takes them longer to grow up, and the longer it takes you to grow up means the longer before you have babies yourself. So if it's difficult exactly. for you to grow up, then it's harder for your population to survive. Fascinating. Um, this was so cool. Paleontologist Ashley Reynolds joining us today to talk about saber cats. Um, we learned again that saber cats um, are just as related to tigers as they are to maybe your cat at home. That climate change was an issue back then and may have led to the loss of lots of really big animals that lived all through North America. We used to have uh, relatives of elephants that lived here. We used to have, what, relatives of camels that lived here. Uh, we had giant, giant sloths. Uh, now, obviously, sloths are, are a lot smaller. So a lot has changed over just a few ten, tens of thousands of years. Um, and we also made the super cute, very awesome, chomping saber cats. Uh, and Ashley, of course, was also here to talk about her latest research um, about some, uh, some saber cat siblings that were growing up with their mom. Oh, and we also learned that maybe saber cats had family structures so that if you maybe got hurt as a cat, maybe when you were a little bit older or you lost a tooth, Maybe there'd be another cat there to help you out. We're still learning so much, but wow, families are very, very important uh, just as your friends are. So having those communities just as important for us today as communities were uh, for Sabre Cats. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone at home. This was an awesome episode. Next week, Tuesday at 2 p.m. right here on Rob Toronto Instagram Live, ornithologist Mark Peck joins us to talk about birds and what's going on with birds in the winter. And I think we're even gonna make, what, a bird feeder too. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Obviously all our episodes go up to YouTube later on. So if we're seeing you there, hello, hello. Thanks again from our household to yours and to your classroom. It's been an awesome week. 
We'll see you later. Bye, everyone. Wear a mask. We love you. Stay safe.